So what I'm doing right now, uh, as an example, is industrializing scenario planning as a use case. Welcome to the Financial Innovations Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Bellani. We're helping CFOs save money and time by investing in cutting edge technology. Really excited to have uh, Sanjeev Segal on the call here. Sanjeev, great to have you on. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. It's great to meet with you. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it is very interesting when, you know, when uh, the team said, hey, we've got Sanjeev here, um, you know, working at uh, some some big name companies. I know most recently Hasbro, in case uh, anyone can't tell by looking at me, I'm a big nerd and uh, Hasbro video games and board games were a big part of my childhood growing up. Um, so I said, oh, we, we've got to have Sanjeev on, on the show over here. So uh, very, very uh, uh, fortunate to have you on. I think we've got a, a bunch of uh, big topics here that, uh, you know, that if you're watching the show, you want to make sure that you stick through to the end on this. Make sure that you, you know, subscribe to the channel, uh, you know, like, comment, uh, engage with us as much as you can um, so that we could have, uh, you know, other great discussions like the one that, that we're about to have here today. So uh, Sanjeev, you know, you have a very impressive career. I know uh, you know, you've you've greatly increased uh, efficiencies, reduced costs at uh, companies that you've worked at, like Hasbro, like others. Um, you know, you want to tell us a little bit about, you know, what are uh, some of the, the things that you've done to kind of contribute to, to some of those uh, those big gains? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, uh, happy to. And, and at the outset, thank you for uh, the opportunity and the invite. I, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, let me let me start by talking, you know, about some of the work that we just completed uh, at Hasbro, right? For for those of us, I'm I'm sure most of us know, but those of us who probably may not, Hasbro is a a fairly large, about a five billion dollar global toy and games uh, company. They run a portfolio of you know very strong, uh, popular brands that includes um, Monopoly, D and D, Magic, Play Doh. Uh, Furby and some of the others, right? And it was actually a personal highlight for me from a career standpoint, both in terms of the impact, right? And, 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 and then the experience. And I'm happy to share that, you know, for, for, for the audience, right? Uh, I joined about two years ago and then I lay out the operating context for, for, you know, what it was like. What was my remit? And then get to exactly, Daniel, what you asked, you know, what was the impact of the work, right? So Hatspro, about a hundred year old company, it's an aggregation of businesses and acquisitions, right? That have been, you know, uh, running fairly, fairly independently in a decentralized manner, right? So think of, think of D and D and magic, right? Or think of entertainment, right? And then, and then, and when you wear the CFO hat, right, you know, you readily see the pros and cons, right? So there is a lot of creative autonomy, right? Independence around the brand, uh, you know, strategy, go to market decisions, et cetera, right? But there are cons as well, right? Because there are, there is some amount of inefficiency or duplication, you know, in SGNA costs, right? In workflows and IT and so forth, right? So, so, so when I joined, basically that was, you know, Part one of three, if I can describe it like that, right? That the business was slowing and we recognized, right? There are, there are some costs that, that we should, that we should address. Uh, second, and we've talked about this externally, right? We made a couple big bets, uh, most notably in the entertainment business, right? Which did not play out, right? Partly because of you know the market, partly because of internal execution, and certainly you know COVID was a big driver, right? If you see what happened to the movie industry, right? You know it, it has still not recovered. You know if you look at the financial performance, right? So basically, we were sitting on an asset that that we started questioning, right? Can we can we really get a, a responsible return on investment on behalf behalf of our shareholders? And third was when we looked at the core business, the toy business itself, we acknowledged that look, our innovation engine has slowed down, right? So basically you combine one, two, and three, you have a, a business that is ripe for transformation, right? 
So we, we could make the call around, let's run a project and independent initiative, et cetera. But we were at a point where we, we decided that we need to relook at both the strategy at one level, right? And second is fundamentally revamp in how we run the business, right? The business model and the operating model, right? With a three, three tier objective, right? Reinvigorating revenue growth, rationalizing our cost structure and reigniting the innovation engine. So these were the three key pillars that we identified and that became my remit, right? as the operating model transformation leader to basically you know line up a set of you know transformation initiatives that that we would then run over over you know the next uh, two year period i think that's that's great like so when you looked at the different different areas um and i didn't even realize that hasbro had as many brands as, as what i what i had originally thought that uh, when you said $5 billion company, and I'm kind of calculating in my head how much of that came from, from me over the years with uh, <laughs> the different things that I've, uh, I've purchased over there. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, in terms of determining, like, what are the strategic initiatives? I know you, you have the three categories over there. How did you use, like, what was worth the, to- the time investment to go and in- investigate further as it relates to you know, maybe on the financial side, uh, you know, in terms of where do the things costs, um, revenue drivers that we should look at? Like, how did you come up with, you know, here's where we should focus our time in order to get the biggest results? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so, so let me, at the headline level, right, let me talk about four or five things, right, that became like the driving, you know, force, if I can, if I can call it that. Right. And then and then and then more granular work underneath. Right. Uh, first and foremost was simplifying our go to market motion. Right. So basically from seven different you know routes to market. Right. To two go to market motions, toys and games. Everything else was basically absorbed in one of one of two areas, right? Think of uh, entertainment, think of licensing, things of you know consumer direct and so forth, because that gave us efficiencies in terms of go to market, right? How we negotiate with say with an Amazon, with a Walmart, with a Carrefour, and so forth, right? And and reduce internal duplication, right? Number one, go to market. Second was consolidating our our GNA and R and D functions, right? So so as I mentioned, in a decentralized model, you know, each BU business unit had its own HR and IT and finance team. So basically we recognized there's a big you know synergy, right, that we could harness combining you know those functions. Tied to that very closely is is a body of work around setting up global shared services. So, so I led up, you know, an end to an RFP with, you know, the, the usual names that you hear about in the MSP space, the service provider space, right? From initial due diligence all the way to knowledge transfer, you know, phases where we looked at about 74 processes within HR, IT, finance and so forth, right? And basically laid out in cascade, right? Of which process, which region, which function, which BU would we be transitioning, right? So global shared services. Third, and 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 I would say a key highlight, right, was setting up an integrated business planning cadence, right? I know we, we, we hear that often, right? But I think it's it's very hard to execute you know, in, 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 a, in a complex, you know, multi BU and highly matrix function, right? So the way we, we looked at it was defining what are the top three to five processes that we need to master for the company to be successful, right? So think of one side of the matrix. The other was along the rules is what are the top three to five metrics that we need to nail for the business to be successful. And against each of those intersections that we defined, what should be the PL decision right? What will be the accountability matrix? How will we run the business? Who is responsible? Who's accountable? Who will be consulted, right? And then at what point in the year, in the month, in the quarter, would we get together to review our performance, right? 
So fairly comprehensive, but to be honest, fairly fairly difficult work, right? Starting out, right? So 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 think of starting with a portfolio management review cycle that goes into demand planning, it goes into supply planning, you start putting the dollars and cents together in terms of integrated financial planning, and lastly, management reviews, right? Right. It, one thing that one thing that you uh, you brought out that you know in terms of looking at the process in totality, right? Like there are a lot of companies out there, they bring on big firms to go do a transformation, you know, and I air quote that as I say it, because the transformation is, we're gonna rip out all the technology that you have or the processes you have, put in brand new ones and and our, our problems are all solved, right? But they're not looking at, well, how are we gonna measure the success of yeah. the new stuff we put in? Who's gonna be accountable for it? You know, how are we going to manage change around all of that, right? And a lot of these projects fail, you know, because it's focusing on, you know, one dimension of the transformation, right? And it sounds like, you know, you guys didn't take that approach of, you know, let's just, let's rip out all our, our business units we have, throw together a couple of new ones and, and we're good, right? It's, it's a matter of, you know, let's look at more than just, you know, the processes that didn't work let's look at more than just what are the business units not making money and cut those out like it, there's there's more to it than than just that no totally and that is where i would say i mean i i think the leadership team coming together right all of us being on the same page that look this is not about one business one region one geo right i think we should almost look at right an alt code alt control delete approach right we should we should look at very seriously revamping right because there were gaps we were visibly seeing internally right and there were headwinds we were seeing externally so so to your point we did bring in an external partner but more from a frankly thought leadership standpoint right not as much around okay you know take out oracle and bring in sap to use an illustration right because that exactly to your point having having <laughs> had a number of wounds from my past, you know, having done it wrong. I think I think there's definitely some level of, you know, uh, humility, right, that was there and alignment that was there at the CNMOST level that helped us basically stay on track. Yeah, no, that that's great. And just a quick reminder to our audience, uh, you know, make sure that you subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Um, you know, comment, uh, you know, let us know what other, um, you know, great ideas and people that we can bring on to the show. Sorry, go ahead, Sanjeev, uh, you were saying. Yeah, I was just going to make one addition, right? So so in addition to, you know, the, the, the strategy placement, right, which was the integrated business planning process, is one critical and frankly, a necessary component that we had to address was organizational hygiene, right? What that meant was basically looking at our labor footprint, right? So, so we had to let go of some of our team members, right? Especially when you start looking at, you know, setting up net new processes, you know, bringing automation in, taking, you know, sort of taking out, you know, duplication, right? So, so there was an inevitable, right, uh, 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 action that the company had to take around letting go of some of, some of our team members, right? starting looking at, you know, spans and layers, right? How many people managers do we need for a business of, you know, you know, the size it was at the time, right? And then and then basically looking at a geographical spread, right? Does royalty accounting need to be done in California? Probably not, right? So then you start looking at, you know, individual processes, right? Do we have the capability? Yes, no. If we don't, the answer is much easier. If we do, we have to make the trade-off, right? Is there labor arbitrage, right? Could we move that process in what we call a best cost location, right? Without losing continuity, without losing, you know, sort of controls and governance, right? Which is, which is, you know, front and foremost. Anytime, right? When you're thinking about, you know, GBS, shared services, COE models and so forth, right? So, so that was the other part, right? To complete the answer, you know, it was a big component of how we looked at uh, organizational hygiene. And that has become, you know, the DNA, right? Of how we will, you know, staff, run, manage, motivate, reward, incentivize the teams going forward. Right. Yeah, no, you, you raise a lot of good points with that. Um, 
you know, one of the things that I just wanted to, to hit on was, you know, it, it sounds like, you know, governance and, and having the frameworks in place was at the forefront uh, and it wasn't the afterthought where um, too often a lot of organizations, will, you know, the, they try to buy their way out of trouble in the sense of, you know, oh, I'm, I'm lacking in, I don't have this capability. Let me just go buy a product that goes and does that capability. Guess what? Now I have the capability, right? And they have the capability, but no one has, knows how to use it. No one knows how to maintain it. It's not documented. People, you know, either leave the job, go somewhere else, and they're, you know, all that domain knowledge is, is lost over there. Um, you know, I've, I've had a couple of projects where uh, I hate to say it, but I've brought in because someone was like literally hit by a bus and no longer able to be there. And that person had no, they're the only ones that knew certain processes. And, you know, it just goes to show that, you know, you're, you're never wishing that kind of stuff to happen, but you always have to make sure that you're prepared, um, you know, for everything that can, that can possibly happen. So maybe do you want to talk a little bit about like, you know, how you, um, you know, establish the governance framework, like, like how, how did you ensure that with whatever changes you guys were making that you maintain that governance, you maintained, you know, whatever change processes that you needed to, to maintain in order to, you know, make it a, a, a smooth transition? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is one area where, you know, right at the beginning, we recognized, right, governance is key. Especially, you know, when you're thinking of businesses that are, you know, based in, you know, different jurisdictions, right? You know, that we were bringing those together, you know, systemically, right? So there's a fair amount of governance, you know, controls that we wanted to be, you know, or rather we had to be responsible for, right? So, so governance is basically part of the change management work stream itself, right? So where we had, you know, four or five key components. To your point, right? Accounting for continuity, right? What if someone chooses to go another place? What if something unfortunate, you know, happens and so forth, right? So, so coming out first and foremost, right, is what we call this. We need to define and communicate our change story or transformation story. And in the early phases, almost, you know, over communicated to the point the audience is sick of hearing, right? Frankly, you know, because that, that message is hard sometimes it is not pleasant but it is absolutely necessary to land right we have to as leaders define a role model and almost if i can say that hardwire new behaviors and new habits for that to be credible right so we can't say hey you know we will do more with the same resources or more with less without us you know sort of role you know role modeling that right so that i think is signaling from the top absolutely critical right building capabilities to your point across the org right if there is only one person you know you know who has the knowledge in his or her head how best do we document that right you know bring bring in continuity and governance, right? So capability building, I think, is a critical component of any transformation or broadly speaking, change management. Engaging uh, stakeholders, you know, to, to, to ensure they may or may not agree, but, but they're aligned on the vision, right? They're aligned, you know, on, on what we need to and how we need to execute this, right? We actually had a, a transformation office steering committee meeting, right? Every Thursday, three o'clock, you know, the ELT would get together. Some of us as, you know, workstream leaders, right? We would get together and share an update, right? Bring up issues, right? Where, hey, you know, we've been trying to work with IT or HR or finance, and then we, we need, we need some mediation, right? It could be on investments. It could be on resources. It, it could be on prioritization, right? So, so we need to not, to be honest, you know, hide those issues, but rather bring those up upfront, right? To ensure we are not losing uh, momentum, right? 
And, and, and lastly is, you know, building out, right, reinforcing mechanisms, right? It could be town halls, staff meeting, you know, s- uh, site visits and so forth, right? Just so the teams, you know, don't feel like, hey, this is some top down headquarter initiative, you know, I, you know, oh, there's probably nothing in it for me, right? So it's basically, as I said at the beginning, right? It's transformation story, right? That's aligned with behaviors and reinforcing mechanisms that has the team realize that, hey, the next three months, six months, maybe 12 months will be hard, challenging, but but it, it is in the service of getting us back to being a growing business again, a profitable business again. So 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 I, I hope that makes sense, right? You know, governance is, you know, it fits in within a broader, you know, change management strategy and a, 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 a cascade of, of a plan. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's all great because, you know, what happens is more often than not, um, you know, you do an undertaking like this and a lot of companies bring in outside help to go and, and do it. And the response for, you know, hey, what's the change management process is train the trainer. Right. And <laughs> uh, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've heard those words, just yeah. train the trainer, which just means, hey, uh, responsibility is going to fall on the customer, on you to go and just do everything, right? And what happens is a lot of companies don't understand the things that you're you're talking through now in terms of making sure everybody's aligned, making sure that, you know, everybody has that shared vision of getting the company, whether it's to profitability, whether it's to greater capabilities or efficiency, whatever it is. And the only time it's communicated is, you know, two weeks before they're about to go live where they say, hey, uh, come in and we want you to test this uh, and uh, follow these scripts. And uh, and now you're going to be an expert in the system. Um, and I hope somebody from uh, from your company is training you because we're not. Right. And, uh, you know, it becomes a huge mess. Right. But, you know, how you've been doing it is you know, the, the way that it should be in terms of, you know, making sure that everyone knows up front, here's what we're doing. Everybody knows that this is in the best interest of the company, that, you know, maybe there will be enhanced capabilities for them. Um, everyone kind of feels heard in terms of, you know, what this project means to them and, and how they can contribute and um, what they can expect out of it as well. And then, you know, making sure communication, communication, communication that along the way that, you know, they're, they're just being constantly brought in to the discussions of this is what's coming. This is what it's going to look like. You know, I don't care if this is the 50th time you've heard it, as long as this is not the first time you're hearing it, um, you know, it's better to to be the 50th time, um, you know, in, in that regard. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, 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 and fully agree, right? You know, one thing I'd say, you know, very humbly is, you know, we did make mistakes, right? So we did, we did, you know, um, uh, fail to act in time, for example, in some cases on communication, right? Or maybe, maybe, you know, not aligning across stakeholder bases. But I think the key really is recognizing we may, you know, miss a step. But course, course correcting it, right? So, so that part I think is extremely, extremely, extremely important to, to get, get the train running, right? Because the work in itself is very hard. We don't want to make it extra hard by not, not reaching out, not partnering, you know, with the stakeholders all through the journey. I think that's, that's very, very, very important lesson. Right. And I mean, you know, mistakes are going to happen. They're going to come along the way. The companies that try to resist and say, hey, we're not going to make any, um, you know, are the ones that are caught by surprise because they're going to happen. It's going to happen, especially, you know, you have a long, you know, I don't know what the time duration of this initiative that you went through, you know, was. It sounds like it was a, a fairly lengthy, you know, process to to go through. But um, you know, the, the longer it is, the more mistakes that are going to happen. But the thing is, is that if you're acting and you're doing everything that you can and you've got, you know, course correction in uh, plans in place for when things don't, you know, come out the way that you want, you'll find that it's going to be a lot easier to get through. There are a lot more manageable. You might have problems, but they're more manageable than had you done nothing and just, you know, crossed your fingers and hoped that, you know, that the rainbow is, is coming, uh, you know, to, to save the day over there. Yeah. No, it is, it is a multi-year, right? For us to do it right and do it right at scale is not a short-term three-month, right, program, right? So, so, so basically being clear 
and and staying connected with our teams, partners, and stakeholders. Right? It's a, it's a must have, not a good to have. Right? So I think that's 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 the over overwhelming, you know, uh, uh, realization and lesson. Right? For for me and for our team, to be honest. Yeah, no, that that's that's great. You know, I know that um, you know you talked a bit about you know like automating processes, and um, you know, um, in a second here, I want to you know kind of shift gears a little bit to AI, and you know, because I know that uh, you're a uh, an avid proponent of uh, of that as well. But um, just just out of curiosity, like how uh, maybe if you could tell us a little bit about your background and maybe how you got into uh, um, the field and you know um, doing the the things that you've been doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, happy to. So I started as an FPE analyst um, a number of years ago now, uh, actually in Singapore, working for FedEx. So, so basically, that one role led to another. You know, moved across in corporate finance, strategic finance, business unit, operational finance. You know, working extensively across roles. You know, both at FedEx and then subsequently, right, internally with stakeholders, and then a lot of work done externally, right, with partners. Like think of think of you know people like McKinsey or Baines or Gartners of the world, right. So that's where I built a very strong muscle, right, looking at what's happening outside and bringing those best best practices in, especially in the finance and analytics function, right. So, so, so building a muscle for driving or scaling business growth, optimizing operational efficiencies, or where needed example in my role at Hasbro is leading a turnaround or a transformation, right? Um, I moved to the US in 2010, the, the time I was at, at Dell and, and basically a number of roles in finance, right? Was, you know, go to market transformation, sales org transformation, Dell EMC integration. And one of the roles there, I was tapped to set up a net new function, which is called customer experience analytics at the time. But we, you know, broadened the remit to growth analytics. So that is where I moved, you know, staying with my roots in finance, but basically added data science added a lot of the advanced analytics capabilities, looking for, is there a white space in the market that we can address, right? Is there a friction for the customer that we can remove, right? Which is not something that, you know, you would see in a PNL or a balance sheet. It's basically looking at transactional data sets and hence the capability around, you know, data science, you know, advanced analytics. And over the, over the past year, getting my hands dirty, you know, a little bit in the AI space, right? Because, I mean, I follow a personal uh, mantra that says, um, if I don't get my hands dirty, I'm going to have cold feet, right? So when it comes to implementation, you know, so so, so I'm happy to talk to some of what, you know, um, I have been developing both um, in, in directly related to the role, but also in terms of, you know, some some areas of thought leadership, you know, within within the AI space. Yeah, I, I, I think, in, and this is why, um, you know, we, we like to have a diverse group of, of guests on the show over here, because what I've been finding is, you know, there are some that are, you know, great on just the finance side or great on, you know, they, they understand a little bit of the technology and, and there are people that are, you know, heavily invested in technology. What I'm finding is, you know, some of the more successful, um, you know, people that, that we've run into are the people that have recognized that to you know get ahead, I need to stay on the cutting edge, right? And and to you know to invest the time, the effort into other things. And you know it's it's great that um, you know you've gotten involved in in some of the technology where you know I'm I'm a technical implementer. People say, hey, how do you know so much about you know finance and and all that? And you know I. I started out, I was trying to be a financial analyst, uh, you know, during the 08 financial crisis, and that didn't um, work out the way that I wanted to, but I had a, a technical background and, you know, was able to do financial system implementations um, and, you know, work with finance and IT and, and all of that. And, you know, and it's just kind of building those skills. But what I'm finding is, you know, if I were to interview many CFOs five, 10 years ago, 
none of them would probably be able to tell me what a data warehouse is or you know uh, anything on the technical side right not not putting anybody down it's just that's kind of like you know finance used to be we are in finance we we talk to it when we have to discuss anything that involves uh, anything technology and what we're finding now is that a lot of people you know i, I had a conversation i mean it must have been a month or two ago now where we're talking about building out data warehouses and i'm like am i talking to someone in finance or am i talking to an it person over here because you know that skill set's evolving so i think it's great that you know that you're um kind of getting involved in ai and getting your hands dirty on on these tools and you know that just kind of makes you more uh you know rounded and uh and able to uh quickly tackle you know tomorrow's challenges today because you're you know you're already working on uh, on those types of things yeah i mean it's it's been a fascinating journey right and and i think it's still very early uh right um and i'll and i'll bring in context in two conversations you know i had you know just this week right one of which was around hey there's so much going on i'll be late to the party right so I'd say, you know, very confidently, you know, I would say we are not, right? Because there is one view of the world, right? If you and I were sitting in, 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 you know, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, or on the other coast, right, in Boston, New York, right, where things are a lot quicker, right? But I think there is the rest of, right, you know, businesses and industries where, you know, I think we are, we are still, frankly, experimenting, right? One. Second, and I think this is where, you know, wearing a CFO hat, hat it's, just, it's very important to recognize coming out of the door AI today is economically unviable for most CFOs. If you just look at the cost of, you know, compute buying, you know, H100, so NVIDIA, you know, the, the picks and shovels, the infrastructure, getting AI engineers, the power energy that's needed to run, you know, that that is very, very expensive, right? And you almost draw a contrast, right, with what happened, for example, with, with, with AI or with e-commerce 20 or 25 years ago, right on day one, these technologies were cheaper, and then, and then that helped in the adoption curve. That is not the case with AI, right? So, so we are still an iteration or two or more away where it really, you know, takes, takes that shit. Yes, there's a lot of momentum, a lot of news, every podcast you go to, et cetera. But I think just from a deployment standpoint, I think this is going to take, you know, several, several quarters, even uh, years, right? Right, because you, you see a lot of the marketing out there that's, you know, hey, if you haven't invested in AI starting from last year, you're done. You're finished. You're, you might as well just close the doors to your business today because someone else is going to overtake you in, you know, in six months or, or, you know, or three months or tomorrow or whatever it is. And you got those that sound the alarm that, you know, you're way too late. And then you've got the others that are like, oh, you know, we'll wait a couple of years, see, you know, for some a product to mature and then we'll think about buying it. Maybe not. Maybe we'll wait a couple of years after that. And, you know, you look at it and, you know, that's kind of how technology is always gone, where you think about things like big data, all that kind of stuff. Right. How many companies started setting up, you know, Hadoop clusters overnight? And, you know, now you look at it today and. I don't want to say like the technology is dead, but like, you know, it's uh, it, it's not very well used. So there's always yeah. the, um, you know, the risk that whatever you're investing in and, you know, spinning up uh, may not be, you know, that may not be the, there may be a better way tomorrow to, to go and do it versus how it's happening today. So, you know, being cutting edge doesn't always have an advantage. It only has an advantage if it works, right? And if it's the long-term solution, um, yeah. Yeah, that's two separate but but related arguments uh, I'll make. I think one is whether as a CFO should I you know take a step back and wait for it to mature. I'd say not a good idea, right? So I'd certainly want to run some experiments with our data sets internally, right? Yes, the technology will take time to mature, etc. But I think we have to run those experiments internally, right? It could be different, you know, models. Uh, or platforms, et cetera, right? But I certainly, you know, strongly encourage that we run those, right? Second, if you look at where applications are, you know, more mature, more ready versus not, 
I basically build out, you know, uh, a, a matrix in my head, right? So it's one for what I call is cognition, right? Which is answering the what question, right? Which I would say technology is you know, fairly, fairly advanced, right? I mean, again, it's a choice of, you know, your preference on which model, you know, do we prefer or we start, you know, building out our own, what we call as SLMs, small language model, which is trained on proprietary data, but fairly, you know, uh, 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 defined data set for what, what we need for a use case, right? Um, and then the other aspects, which is, which is um, uh, reasoning and, and inference. Now, those areas where, you know, if you're trying to mirror how a human brain works, that I would say is work in process, right? Because you and I, you know, are not always the most objective, right? We have biases, we have lived experiences, we have perceptions, right? So just think about, right, how do I, you know, uh, train an algorithm or an LLM to think like me? I mean, it's, it's a great, you know, conversation, but I don't know how soon, how quickly, how reliably we'll get to that place. So in other words, you know, answering the what question is far easier than the, the why and the how question. Because that gets more multifaceted in terms of not just data sets that, you know, the, the model has to look through, but also the relationship between data sets, right? So, so that's where there's some, some fairly novel platforms that are, that have, that have come out. I, I have been experimenting with one called Ikigai, which basically uses knowledge graphs, right? So it's not something you and I could process in our heads, but certainly take the advanced, you know, uh, analytical capabilities that comes from knowledge graphs that sit on top of, you know, the AI, right? That gets us, you know, sort of accelerate time to insights, especially across more complex data sets. So, so, so that's, that's my, that's my, you know, view. I could, you know, I could very well be wrong, right? But, but certainly I think we, we have to experiment and we have to start looking at, you know, what categories of use cases, you know, that, that we can, that we can, you know, start working on coming out. Yeah. I, I think that the companies that are, you know, I don't want to say failing, but maybe falling short in the AI space that have invested in it are the ones that are trying to do too much with it right now, right? The, like to your point of like, I want this AGI, you know, artificial general intelligence, like I want to clone myself and have someone that's going to think like me and act like me and all that stuff, right? And it's, you know, I, there's a lot of money being poured into that kind of technology. Yeah. And it's, do you really need that? Or do you really need um, something simpler that's going to help you make smaller types dis types of decisions and get you part of the way there right and um and that's why like i see too often like even um you know because i'm building out my own uh, ai platform uh to help the fpna function um and the goal is not to replace analysts or replace people as much as to you know give them a tool belt to greatly enhance their efficiency and, you know, there are a lot of times that, you know, I, I start to see as I look at, you know, how are certain things being done? And it's, well, I have uh, an AI, you know, deciding this or that or whatever. And I said, well, like, can't you just like write like a basic function that does that kind of decision? Like, do you really need to have an AI do like you're you're having an AI do it just for the sake of having an AI do it? Right. Yeah. And and there's not a lot of thought that's being put into what do we delegate to a language model versus what do we delegate to someone who can just code a function to go and do that same exact thing? Do we really need the language model for it? And, and, you know, when you look at things like, you know, what is the percentage accuracy on something? Well, the more that you have, at least as of right now, the more you have AI decide, the less accurate it's going to be. If it has to make 30 different decisions to, you know, to determine a process, it's going to be less accurate than if it just has to make one decision and, you know, you can kind of code around the other decisions that it needs to to make so you know you see a lot of companies that are either trying to over invest or they're looking like oh you know i'll wait for something to be mature that that's fine but you know by the time it becomes mature the cost to acquire it in terms of you know you've got to get people that have been trained up on it um you know salaries are going to be much higher at that point and you know capabilities 
you know, that's going to, you know, that's going to be a, a, a problem. So, you know, I want to get your thoughts, um, you know, on that as well. Yeah, no, no, to- totally. And I think as you were speaking, you know, I, I, I couldn't help but think of, you know, machine learning days, right? Where we would, we would often come back and talk about if the model is getting to the answer, but it is overfitting the answer, right? So then basically, you know, it is so customized, so precise that this algorithm will work with only one data set, only one at a time, right? Which again, in a world of unconstrained budgets, right? Yes, doesn't matter. But we know that that is more often not the case, right, than, than, than it is. So basically, how do we, right, to your point on, you know, stay away from the equivalent of overfitting problem from machine learning, right, is basically have enough of an intelligence or, or, or logical reasoning built in that gives us the answer, right, without having to, you know, invest in, in training and fine tuning. Because remember, training is very expensive, right? You know, so, 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 so again, if you remember GPT-3 or GPT-4, I forget, right? The training cost ran into one hundreds of millions, right? So, so again, now there are platforms that allow like AWS Bedrock, right? You can go in and train your model, right? For far lesser, but still it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not in the hundreds of thousands, right? It still is prohibitive. So again, we always, you know, stay away from or stay mindful rather of the costs of training and the costs of Precision, right? So, so just just the economics of what is what is viable, you know, from a from a stable run rate uh, standpoint. Right, and, and what what requires training versus what requires just a little bit of prompt engineering, right? Where, uh, you know, when, when you go and train a model, you're passing in. Here's a question. Here's the answer that I'm expecting. Here's another question. Here's the answer I'm expecting. And you're going through maybe a million records of that, you know, instances to try and get this machine to pick up, okay, here's the pattern with what I'm being asked and what I need to answer versus more often than not, you can just go and tell the system, I'm going to ask you this and I want you to answer it like that. Um, And it's, you know, maybe you're spending an extra penny for every request that you're making to, um, to the language model versus, you know, you've spent, Two three hundred thousand dollars up front training this thing to then be able to answer. You know, there's there's a lot of distinction that needs to happen between what's a you know what's a training problem versus what's a prompting problem. You know, versus is this even a problem and should AI even be doing this in the first place? Totally. Or if I can add, is should I look at more more um, targeted models, right? So I think of say something like um, Harvey, right, which is which is an LLM just for the legal profession, right, or think of Piper, which is for uh, sales agents. Devin, I'm, I'm guessing you would have gotten your hands dirty with it. Is basically a, a you know AI engineer, right? So something that can help me optimize my Python code, for instance, right? So basically, yes, we 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 can go in you know solve world hunger using a large LLM and spend you know big seven digit. Uh, budgets, but can I use SLMs to help get to the same answer quicker and, frankly, uh, cheaper? Right. Yeah. No. That that's great. And I mean, um, this is this is a great discussion that we're having. You know, highly recommend uh, those watching. You know, to make sure that if you're not subscribed to the channel, that that you subscribe, follow us. Uh, you know, leave any comments uh, in here that you know we, we we'd be happy to to get back to them. Um, in terms of AI, like where are, where are the areas that you think are going to be the biggest help to, you know, to the finance, the accounting, to the executive function? Um, you know, what are things that people should be looking into? How do we get through this cloud of hype of, you know, there are things that are real in there. There are things that are overblown. There are things that might be underblown. But, you know, how do we kind of sift through that and say, you know what? I'm going to make a small investment to get started just to, you know, explore the capabilities and see if there's something there. Like, what are the things that that a company should be looking at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say answering the what question is probably the first place where I would start, right? Just looking at, for example, how much revenue did I generate in a certain region, in a certain country, in a certain week, right? What was the growth rate, right? What was the profitability? Which customer? So, so in summary, 
<laughs> a BI capability, right? That's probably the, one of the easiest places where the data structures are fairly well defined, right? If you look at the, 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 the master data management backend, right? So from a training standpoint, right? Fine tuning standpoint, it's much easier getting started, right? On top of which we can build, for example, scenario planning, right? Uh, strategic planning and forecasting. So what I'm doing right now, uh, as an example, is industrializing scenario planning as a use case, right? So building my own GPT, you know, with with formulations, with uh, uh, forecasting techniques that I'm training, you know, the G GPT on, and then basically throwing different data sets, right? Throwing, to be honest, errors in my data set, right? For, to see, right, hey, does it, does it not pick up, right? Because real world data, as you and I painfully know, it is sparse, it is dirty, and it needs it needs transformation, right? So how best do we get the algorithm or the model in this case to really read that, right? So 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 starting with the what, the BI planning, you know, um, forecasting, scenario planning, variance analysis, you know, type use cases. I would say they give us the confidence, right? You know, again, as a CFO, head of FPNA or strategic finance, you know, before we go into, you know, the more complex use cases, looking at, you know, services data with marketing data with finance data. I think that that I would say we are probably, you know, some some time away from that. Yeah, that's that's very interesting what you brought up. Uh, we'll have to uh, to compare notes at some point because uh, I think there'll there'll be some uh, opportunities to collaborate with the software and, and things that you're doing and and some of the stuff that I'm doing in the space over there. Um, you know, so uh, so we'll see kind of where where that goes. But um, you know, I think there's kind of a AI arms race, right? Of like who can come up with best forecasts, most efficient, you know, this and that using AI and um, you know, it, it sounds like, you know, it's going to going to take a bit of time to cr fully crack the code on on all of that. But the the key message, at least, you know, what I'm you know gathering from our conversation here is, you know, in definitely invest in learning the capabilities, but, you know, invest uh, intelligently where, you know, you're not necessarily trying to tackle the, the biggest problems right now. Let's look at, you know, what are some of the smaller wins and, you know, some of the um, other pieces that might build some capabilities, but not necessarily, you know, trying to solve world hunger, you know, on, on day one. Totally, totally. Because, and again, if you're wearing the CFO hat, right, I would say, yes, acknowledge the novelty, right? But, but recognize, right, it'll be a combination of speed, quality, and cost, right? That will be the determinant, right? On what basically does or does not accelerate, right? Because there's a lot of money to your point, you know, the arms race that are being put in, but I'm not sure if it is going to get the highest ROI, certainly not in the short term, but I'd, I'd, I'd speculate probably not even in the medium to long term, right? I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong, but, but certainly, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll all have to, you know, wait and watch. Yeah, and, and I know we're um, you know we're running close to uh, to time over here, but in in your opinion, like where you know for companies with limited budgets that are saying, hey, look, they're you know I'm I'm just inundated with uh, I'm being told I need you know I need dashboards, I need AI, I need you know uh, reporting software, I need planning software, I need this, I need that, I need a new ERP, I need you know all of that. Like where. Where is the value today? Like, what? Where should these companies be looking to to invest? Well, I would say, in the spirit of right, um, what we discussed, start small, right? Build out small use cases, right? And use one of the off-the-shelf models, right? Yes, it is tempted to do something, you know, internally on our own, etc. But capabilities are scarce. Capabilities are expensive. Certainly, infrastructure is prohibitively expensive. So I'd be very confident going on, for example, Anthropic just launched 3.5, right? Very capable model and, and it's free, right? So an API version does give you that protection, right? Same thing, chat GPT for, for, uh, Omni, right? A very powerful model. Again, we can leverage the API or an enterprise account, right? To basically, you know, uh, uh, take care of the governance, the privacy consideration. That's where, frankly, I would go. Whether it is reporting, BI analytics, forecasting, you know some of the, the the most common use cases that 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 you and I 
would see, you know, in finance, right? Don't try to, don't try to, you know, spin up a net new team, hire very expensive AI engineers and buy H100s, et cetera. It not worth it. Right, right. No, that, that makes, that makes a whole lot of sense. Um, you know, take small manageable risks, you know, out there, gain the capabilities, you know, it may work out. It may not work out. If it doesn't work out, you're not out millions of dollars, uh, you know, with it not working out. And, you know, once the capabilities do mature, you're going to have team members that are going to already have at least some of the skill set, if not the skill set needed to, to be able to run and manage those, uh, those things. Exactly. And if you look at the, the life cycle of technology, right, for the longest time, right, is technology gets cheaper, right, and it gets more accessible, right, which I think is the bonus, right, for us, right, so, so it's get cheaper, more accessible, and then that, that takes care of value, right, you know, that gets, takes care of, you know, how quickly can we get to the value, both internally, right, as a finance leader, but also back to the business, right? Insights that drive strategic decisions, financial decisions, business decisions, customer decisions, and so forth, right? So, so certainly that'll be, again, wearing the finance hat, right? I think is what, what would I say is top of mind. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Um, you know, and, uh, really happy to have had this discussion with you here today and, uh, I know I got a lot out of it. I know our audience definitely is is going to get a, a ton out of it. Uh, before we wrap up, any any other final uh, pointers or words of wisdom or anything that that you have uh, for for those watching? But I would say thank you again for the opportunity. You know, it's an it's an area you know close to heart. Something I can you know talk about you know for hours. Uh, certainly, you know, I'm, I'm actually beginning to write a series of blog posts, right? So coming out in the next, you know, few weeks, I'm active on LinkedIn. So if there's anything I could, you know, um, you know, help participate in, you know, feel free to reach out on link- LinkedIn. And, uh, yeah, I mean, wish, wish the teams, the audience, the best of luck in their, in their journey. No, I appreciate that. And, you know, we'll make sure that we include a link to, uh, to your profile there if, uh, for those that, that want to reach out. Um, you know, when, when you release your, your blog post there, we could also link to, uh, to that as well. So that way, uh, you know, they can subscribe to, uh, to your blog. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks again for the opportunity. Yeah, it was great having you on and, uh, we'll definitely uh, look to have you on again in the, in the future. Perfect. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Sanjeev.